All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining right on time. Uh, this is Aaron Doucette with AppGeo, and we'll be getting started with today's presentation in just a couple minutes. Um, we are waiting for our attendees to hop into the room, and in just one or two minutes, we will get started. So who is AppGeo? Well, we're geospatial innovators and we're problem solvers. Um, the company's been around for over 30 years, helping governments and corporations with innovative solutions. Um, we are a partner to Google, Hexagon, and um, as of now here, and we offer objective advice on all platforms. So between all the AppGeo employees we have, there's a lot of different skill sets, a lot of different backgrounds, and we're always here to give you that objective advice, um, no matter the problem. And, you know, also importantly, and it'll tie into today's conversation a little bit, we're believers in open source and contributors to various free projects, um, including the, the Bring Food application, which is an example of where we have tried to do good in the greater geospatial community. But without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speakers, starting with Frank Winters, who we are honored to have on this call today. He is the GIO for the state of New York and also the active NISJIC president. So he is likely um, not a stranger to many of you, and I've really enjoyed getting to work with him so far on this presentation. I think you're going to be uh, really really interested in what he has to say. You know, in his role in New York, he oversees um, ortho imagery, elevation data, parcels, streets, boundaries, broadband data, the list goes on in terms of, you know, you know the type of data that Frank is responsible for managing. Um, and on the right hand side, another guy who should be no stranger to many of you, Bill Johnson. He uh, was in the position of GIO for New York and now he's here with us at AppGeo and his career spans, uh, again, now 36 plus years, um, touching all these types of data, all these types of stories. Um, and again, he was there for that initial development of the New York State Imagery Program, now 20 years old. So both these guys go way back. And before we get started, Bill, I'd love to hear just, you know, how you guys got to know each other um, and what your careers, um, how they've intertwined up to this point we where we are today. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, you know, Frank and I worked very closely together for so many years. It's, I mean, we had to stop and pause and think about it. It turns out it's about 29 years, a little over 29 years that uh, Frank and I started working together at the, originally at the New York State Department of Transportation, which before the state of New York had a, had a GIS, had, had a state GIS office, the DOT was kind of front and center in that work. And, uh, and that's where, where Frank and I first started working together. And we've worked very closely together all through my my career years in the state of New York. And when I retired uh, in 2016 as the first GIO in New York, Frank uh, became the, uh, the, was promoted to that as the second GIO for, for New York. So we've had a lot of common ground. I, I joke that I know Frank about as well as I know my brother. And that's, <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, anything to add, Frank, before we get into the conversation here? Yeah, it, uh, looking back, um, Bill, it's it's been uh, flown by. We've really enjoyed it. But um, you know, Bill's been my direct supervisor for about half of my career. But uh, for the other half, uh, we still collaborated and worked closely together. Um, so it's been an interesting uh, interesting path that neither one of us could have really predicted. But it's been pretty consistent. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Aaron, uh, I don't think you mentioned it, but Frank is the current president of the National States Geographic Information Council, NISGIC, which uh, is really the association of state GIS leaders across the U.S. So Frank, in his current role, has really got his hand on the tiller for a lot of national geospatial uh, issues and priorities. So we have a, we have a lot to talk about, um, and I think... Uh, we both have a lot of history uh, to, to kind of bring to the conversation here. So let's kind of get into it. Um, I think, you know, um, here's what we want to cover. We're going to talk a little bit about what, what we're talking about with this blended GIS data and then a lot of examples uh, to illustrate what's going on. And then I think we can get into, you know, um, how you as a geospatial professional can tap into this because it really is an important new trend. Um, and I thought, Frank, we could start uh, uh, just with, you know, what what you're seeing with uh, the vaccination rollout. Here's a here's like a very current example, and it is a, it's a great uh, mix of of commercial and government data coming together. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? 
Well, sure. Um, you know, when things are happening, we sort of take them for granted that they're happening, right? But if you think about the data that has to come together in order to understand the pattern of vaccination um, across the country or in our you know, local neighborhoods, um, I can be vaccinated at my local independent pharmacist, at my grocery store, at a state site, a FEMA site, or my community college, or even the casino down the road where the county's running a site. All that data then has to coalesce and come together somehow for us to understand the complete pattern. So um, it's pretty great that that data is coming together. Um, and we're trying to move forward to make that better and better. So for instance, do we know the home address of all those vaccinated? And can we aggregated that up so we can look at patterns um, aggregated by something like census tract so we um, can see where the anomalies are? There's an enhancement um, uh, yet to come, um, but the fact that we have counts that are rolling together, that's blended data, it's already happening. Yeah, I think you, so perfect example in my own household, you know, I got vaccinated at the local Walgreens pharmacy. My wife got vaccinated at the state run site at the uh, University of Albany campus, um, where there were you no know, National Guard troops directing traffic and it was all a government operation. So yeah, all this stuff's coming together. I, I think um, one thing it's important to keep in mind as we talk through this is that you know, we tend to think about kind of monolithic data sources, you know, that you've got a government data set or you've got a licensed commercial data set, but more and more, these things are just seamlessly working together. And so the, the question to ask is really about how can you do the best job? You know, what pieces can you bring together that are gonna let you be most effective? And I think that if we if we keep that in mind, as opposed to thinking more, uh, binary about sources as if they're in conflict with each other, because what we really want to do is bring them together and mine the best value out of both, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I've got kind of a new North Star, and that is for every minute I spend or we spend, members of this community spend, how do we maximize our impact? And, you know, this, this idea that if you've if you are controlling every bit of the GIS data you need to get your job done, you're probably doing something wrong. Right, because you have to rely on other people's expertise and they're in their lane doing what they're best at. And now I'm going to rely on that, whether that's another government agency um, or whether that's a, a commercial provider or even uh, crowdsource data from the public. Um, there are certain slices that we're best at, and there are other slices that someone else is best at. How do we how do we really maximize our impact? Yeah, no, I think that's so important. All right, so I, I think to get into this. Uh, to talk about blended data, we need to get into a little more, more detail. So first of all, uh, when we're talking about the blend, it's going to be a mix of government data, which generally I'm talking about data that's released in the public domain. It doesn't have restrictions on it. And it's the kind of data that, you know, is on the state GIS clearinghouses across the country and so forth, or it's in uh, the federal geo platform, for example. Um, the, the other data sources that we're talking about from the commercial side are almost always made available under a licensing model. So I think it's important that we spend just a minute talking about these licensing models because the way it works is the commercial owners of the data want to be able to resell it multiple times. And the way they do that is they retain ownership of it and they grant you as the user rights to use it under a license. And that, that can sound um, you know, a little daunting, like, uh oh, all these limitations, but we're already doing that in so many ways, you know, in, in our in our everyday lives that uh, you, know, you think about, you know, we used to buy our music, you'd go to the record store and buy albums, you know, you had milk crates full of <laughs> full of albums. I don't have too many left anymore, but that's the way we bought our music. Now, most people are, are buying it through things like Spotify, where it's a subscription we let them amass the catalog of, of music and we just pay for a right to access it and use it. And that's the way these license models works. And there's lots more examples with things like uh, video content um, or even things like the way you lease a car as opposed to buying a car where you don't actually own the car. You, you The leasing company is giving you rights to, to drive it and treat it as your own vehicle, but you're paying less than the full cost of that car. You're only paying for its value in the two or three years that you own it and, and uh, letting the lease company deal with the rest of it. So lots and lots of ways that we're already doing this. Um, but let's talk more about these licensing. So Frank, I know you've, you've looked into 
some of these models a little more closely than I have, particularly the Creative Commons. You want to you want to hit on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, and something that's kind of interesting, you know, whoever I'm sharing data with, either I'm a producer and someone else is a consumer, or I'm consuming their data, that's part of that relationship that I want to stay around. So if I'm licensing data from a company, I want to make sure they're in business next year so I can keep doing it, right? So um, it's the the license is really the vehicle by which we're clear about the expectations and builds the trust so we can rely on each other, right? So that's that's a little different way to look at licensing. But it was interesting, the data that we were making public across the country, speaking on behalf of lots of states now, um, we were making a lot of data public, but yet the, the ingestion wasn't happening and the big commercial map companies that we wanted to take that mm. so people can use their cell phone and, and take advantage of our data when they're interacting with their, with their app on their cell phone to you know, um, go traverse the road network. That wasn't being ingested because those companies needed some assurance and some clarity on how we intended them to use it. So they were putting out license agreements for us to sign. And we're like, well, wait a minute, we're making the data public. We can't sign your license. So now if we come together with a common license where it makes it very clear I'm publishing this data, in this case, we don't have to dive too much into the details, but Creative Commons Zero is one that's very popular now and and, uh, getting traction where I can say, I'm issuing this under Creative Commons Zero, have at it. It's got some protections in there, but it makes it very clear that I intend to put that data in the public domain. So if we're all using a similar license or the same license, we don't mm-hmm. have to keep reevaluating the terms yeah, and yeah. it just makes that so much more efficient. Yeah, no. And, that, and I actually do remember uh, back in, in my state days uh, when we uh, we had one of the big uh, internet map companies that wanted to uh, use some of our data. And we said, look, it's it's available for free download. You can, It's openly available. Knock yourself out. And they couldn't do it because their attorneys needed to know the provenance of that data uh, as documented in a license. And so we were at a standstill. So yeah, so these some of these models really allow us to solve that problem. Well, so and now if, if we, one other point on that, the more we have and we use the same language, the easier it is to comply. So if I've got relationships with a hundred companies and I've signed a hundred different versions of something similar, how am I going to tell my, my <laughs> users or, or my staff, okay, you know, there's these hundred things to worry about and they're all a little bit different. If we have one common set of language, compliance goes up as well. Cause we take these, these um, agreements pretty seriously. Very yeah. seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, even the setting creative commons aside for a moment, what I've observed is that the data, the, G, the GIS uh, data companies that are operating under a license have become more liberal in their licensing terms uh, what they will allow people to do uh, under their licenses keeps getting getting better so where you know some years ago we might have resisted using commercial data i think those barriers are, are continuing to to fall um, yeah so let's uh let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that this um, data can be blended and um you know, some of you may have seen a blog I wrote about this. Uh, I guess we can put the link up uh, later or, or send it out afterwards for some of you that missed it. But I categorize things in, in uh, four different hoppers for the way I see some of this blended data starting to happen. And the first of them is where a government agency might have a gap where there is no source for the data. And, uh, and they would use that uh, uh, under a license to fill that gap. And an example we have is, um, you know, when we were in the state uh, trying to support Homeland Security, we needed business locations. And the state data set uh, from the state labor department uh, by state law could not be shared because it uh, was related to unemployment insurance and that was private data that could not be released. So we didn't, even though the inside the state databases there were business listings, we couldn't use it. Um, and so we went and, and licensed a commercial data source for that. That's a gap fill. Um, and actually I was talking with Rich Grady, the AppGeo president uh, earlier this week, and he was reminding me that, um, you know, going back almost 20 years now, the uh, the National Homeland Security GIS data program, which is called HSIP, the the um, I forget what the acronym breaks down for here in the moment here, but um, the uh, they did a national assessment of of data sets 
uh, nationwide, and they, they didn't have a good uh, street network file, they licensed Navtech data. They didn't have a good nationwide business listing file, they licensed uh, Dun & Bradstreet. They didn't have a consistent national imagery data set and they licensed Digital Globe. And that was mixed with uh, government data sets for boundaries and for hydrography and for uh, other features that all became this national uh, asset for responding to Homeland Security incidents. And it's a great, great mix of that, uh, that data gap. Uh, Frank, you probably remember working with some of that HSIP data, right? Absolutely. I was sporting a big curly head of hair at the time too. So that's, <laughs> and we're going back a while. You know? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I had dark hair in those days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so another example of, of um, blended data is um, where a commercial source can serve as a replacement for what historically might have been a government source data. And the example that comes immediately to mind is imagery. More and more government organizations, rather than contracting for government-owned imagery, are finding it much less expensive to use a licensed imagery. So it used to be there were not very many sources for imagery. And now it's basically a commodity out in the market. You have lots of choices for imagery and you can get licensed imagery at a fraction of what it would cost you to license it on your own. And the reason is, is that the imagery companies are reselling it multiple times. And so no one buyer is paying the full cost of the imagery, which ironically is what happens when governments buy it. They, they're paying the full cost themselves. So there's a, there's a one for one example. So those are those are pretty easy, a gap fill or a replacement. I think that where it gets more interesting is where we get a little bit more complex in the way that the blending happens. And another example is where we might use um, a commercial data set, a licensed data set to trigger an update in an authoritative government data set. And, um, you know, the example I, I, I have in my head is to be able to tap into some of these new data sets that have things like uh, traces of cell phone movement or data that the package delivery services use and they scan the, uh, the package on your doorstep and part of that scan picks up a GPS coordinate. So they've got the back door for your, your dwelling in, in, the, in the data set. And those things can be great for updating an address data set. And typically in the government sector, you know, the, uh, the data feeds for, for doing that might be a little slow. It might take, uh, you know, weeks or months for a, a new address to make it into a, into a 911 database, for example, where, you know, these commercial sources, as soon as somebody's living in that house, they're going to start ordering things, packages, pizzas are going to get delivered. Uh, the cell phone movements are going to show that there's a cell phone that's been stationary in that location overnight and we're, Oh, these are all great indicators. So in a, in a scenario like that, the, the commercial data set doesn't necessarily end up in the final uh, government data set. It's used in the process for maintaining it. So that's a really nice uh, kind of a blend model. And then uh, another flavor, and Frank, I think you, you're familiar with this because I know the state of New York is doing this in a couple of ways, is using a third party that's doing transaction processing on behalf of a government agency. And you know, like the, maybe you could speak to how the, the fishing and hunting license renewal process works. Uh, sure, both um, whether you're applying for your fishing hunting license or whether you're um, trying to reserve a campsite, um, that's contracted service, through, you know, in the, in the case of the campsites, Reserve America is the website that our environmental conservation organization uses um, <clears throat> under contract and it's, it's their, it's uh, Reserve America's uh, hardware and software, but it's New York State facilities and, and that's all blended together. So you show up at the office of the campsite and, and you're on the same page. So that's, that's pretty great. Um, hey, Bill, I'll take you back um, to, the, um, to the example of, of uh, the trigger. Um, as you know, we make um, millions of addresses available in, through a geocoder in New York and we make that publicly available. Well, our utility company uh, was using our geocoder and they sent us a note and said, hey, we're using your geocoder, we love it, but we have some uh, electric meters that are at addresses that are not in your data set. Would you like a set of all of our electric meters? And we yeah, said, yes, a, please. That's a fantastic yeah. example. Yeah, so the, you know, what we're seeing is there's so much data being collected now as routine 
part of the business work. The op, you know, it's the operational reality for so many companies now to be picking up uh, location information into their data sets. And um, that's, that wasn't happening the way it is, you know, 10, 20 years ago, there was very little of that. Now there's an explosion of it. So it's really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and I've got a, a, an example uh, right within my own family of um, a supplement of, you know, we've got our imagery program that we're super proud of, and it serves a great purpose. Um, you know, but there are times that um, some of the commercial data might supplement it. And this wasn't um, in our state. This happened in um, Colorado. My, my son, Luke, was doing a, um, his master's work, and he was trying to build a model that was a deep machine learning, artificial intelligence type model that mapped wetlands that are very specific wetlands high in the mountains fed by snowmelt. And in that case, um, using data with very high temporal resolution was key because it was very specific period of the, of the season where these wetlands really showed up too early. They're covered in snow too late. They're kind of dried up. Yeah. So if he picked the right temporal resolution, he could pick from imagery that was flown every day. Um, he could sacrifice a lot of spatial resolution and his models worked better by picking the right time of um, the season to the, to the day or week. So that was pretty neat um, idea of supplementing um, an imagery program with one that uh, had a different different characteristics. Yeah, so that's a great example. You know, so uh, I assume it was probably planet data that they, they fly that they fly the whole globe every day. Yeah, uh, kind of amazing. Uh, yeah. So you can pick the day that you want. <laughs> it was pretty great. <laughs> Yeah. So the, the, um, just in terms of how this data blend is is impacting everyday GIS practitioners, I think there's this two other mechanisms that are happening that uh, maybe it, it's worth stopping and, and talking about for a moment. One is a lot of software licenses come with data already bundled in. Many of the GIS companies, uh, including Esri, and I think we could name a lot more, uh, include a bunch of data sets uh, in the shrink wrap license that comes with the software. So you are probably already using um, some of these commercial data sets. It might be the base map layers, or it might be a other value add layers that are, that are, that come with the software. This is it's a win win for everybody because it's a win for the software companies because it provides greater usability immediately. So you're not just getting an assemble it yourself. You know, okay, I got I got the software now. I got to go source data. If it if it all comes bundled together, you can be in business very quickly. And then. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a lot of movement toward these geospatial platforms where you assemble your capabilities through APIs. And more and more, it's, it's kind of getting to a world where it's codeless, where you can, you know, you don't even have to be a programmer to string together some of these API functions and, and you're creating great GIS functionality. And a lot of those APIs, which is an application programming interface, for those of you not familiar with the term, but they are things like... A, um, they, they, they perform a single function generally per API and very often include uh, very sophisticated data sets to make that function happen. And a, and a great example is a geocoder. Uh, so some of the commercial geocoders, when you pass your street address to it, it's using a bunch of data sets in the back end to figure out the, the latitude longitude, which it passes back to you as the result of that API call. So there's a lot of this data bundling and we see that with Google, with here and many of the other uh, companies now um, where they, the platform approach uh, where you're licensing a bundle of APIs includes a lot of data. So um, yeah, I think uh, Frank, unless you wanna pause here, let's move on to some examples. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, so again, I think it, it's worth a little bit of a little bit of history here of, of how this has happened. Um, you know, as we mentioned with like the uh, the federal HSIP program, it's been going on for about twenty years or more. Um, but in the early in the early days of my career and, and yours, Frank, you know, we didn't we weren't really aware of much data bundling, and particularly at the DOT. When you think about it there was so much data that the DOT managed and it was all collected and managed by DOT staff, whether it was traffic count data or pavement condition data or highway maintenance data or uh, safety data. The, all of it was, you know, we had a, a big workforce out across the state collecting that data, mostly on an annual basis. And when you look now at what's going on in the transportation world, 
uh, there's, there's vehicles with sensors all over them, driving the roads all over the place, collecting data uh, left and right. It's a, just a, an amazing change in that, just in the span of your career and mine. So it kind of started out with some companies uh, that originally took some government data like GDT uh, started out with the Census Bureau Tiger file, which came out, uh, you know, for the 1980 census. And they, and they uh, vastly improved that and made a, made a seamless road network file and added a lot of new attributes on it. And Navtech, uh, another company that started out uh, uh, in the in the road business and and probably started out with the with a version of the census data as well, so those were kind of some early things. But then we had the whole internet boom and these big internet companies that weren't around when you and I started our GIS careers, and uh, and they decided to make huge investments in global mapping capabilities, and. Um, you know, in the early days of your career and mine, all of, all good maps were produced by uh, you know government organizations. It was USGS and and state states were publishing their highway maps and, and producing them in house and so forth. That stuff's all all pretty much gone, and it's people are relying on the maps that, that they get on their phone from Google and Apple and others. Uh, so there's been that whole surge of, of investment in mapping data as a result of the big internet companies. And now we're seeing, um, you know, we, we have this whole internet of things. Cisco is big in the internet of things where there's just sensors all over the place. And the car companies, this consortiums of car companies are, are all making huge investments in very detailed data along the roadways for autonomous vehicles. So the, the, the quality, the volume, the richness of these data sets is just growing at a phenomenal pace. And um, so it's not, uh, we're not uh, having to ask if data is available in almost every case you can think of, it's like, what's the best of the, of the data out there? Um, so Frank, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear your observations on, on how this trend has is, uh, is come about too. Yeah, you, you brought back a lot of good memories. And, you know, back in the day, we were making um, regular printer press production runs of paper maps at the DOT, right? Yeah, that's and, right. You know, it was like the art and science of cartography. And, and, I, and I loved it, right? But in order to make the next contribution, the thing I loved most about my current job is the piece I had to leave behind to make a different contribution. Um, mm. So we could lament, um, you know, the days of the classic cartographer, you know, going away, or we could or we could expand our impact and uh, kind of embrace um, these new, um, you know, these new relationships. And, and one thing that um, we keep asking the question, what is the role of government in this space? I've been in government my whole career, you know, but whatever your industry is, what, you know, what's the role of your industry? What, what role are you uniquely um, lined up to play? And that's not a question that we really need an answer to. That's just the kind of question that we have to repeatedly ask to keep ourselves um, focused. And, you know, an example that comes to mind is one that's been around for quite a long time, but it was really ahead of its time. And that is the GTFS, so the General Transit Feed Specification. And that ah, sounds like right. a buzzword right. to folks. But, you know, I, so I take a trip to Syracuse or Chicago or whatever. And I, so I go to Syracuse and I want to take a bus. I don't need to figure out that it's the Centro Bus Company and look at their website and get their bus schedule. I just use my phone because they publish that. Uh, bus schedule, their stops and their routes um, in a way that all the major providers, anyone that wants it, including researchers, um, academics and, and cell phone companies, they can all just pull it in and, um, and it just works, right? And I can just find my bus and I can, and I can do my thing. Yeah. And if I could pause you there for just a second. What I love about that, Frank, is that's a blend going in the other direction. Right. That's the commercial world seeing a value in data that they don't have uh, without cooperation from the government sector. Yeah. And so they worked to create this uniform standard so that all of the government organizations that run transit systems can make it easily available. So it's a win for everybody because as a citizen, you just want the stuff to work. And if you're a, if you're a government operator of a transit system, you want more riders. And, uh, and if you're a, an internet company, you want more eyeballs on your app. And so everybody's winning with this thing. And so it's a great, it's a great blend example. 
Right. And, I, and I'd rather maintain a bus than maintain a website anyways, right? If I'm in that business, I'd rather drive a bus. You know? and let them, you know, so it, it really does put us all in the right role, you know? Yeah, no, um, that's, that's great. And um, the next, so I know, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. The, Sorry. The, the thing that, that is the immediate tag right off of that and flows right into it is work that we're doing uh, with NISJIC um, and FHWA. Um, and that is to, to look at more of those data sets where government is the trigger. So government assigns an address. Government mm -hmm. calls for changes on our road network. Government would put up a new exit number sign. So picture you're driving along, looking at your cell phone in an unfamiliar city, and uh, you're looking for exit six, but the exit numbers had just changed, and now it's exit 60. And you know, get off now. And you're you're surprised, and you know, accident rates certainly <laughs> have to um, increase when that happens. And I believe that automatic wayfinding has completely changed the traffic safety landscape of the country. Some for good and some for bad. I'm a better driver when I know my exit in Boston is off to the left and I could see where it, the configuration on my map and I look out the window and I drive it. But yeah. you know, in other cases, it's, it's had some pretty disastrous effects. Um, and uh, the example um, of uh, bridge clearance, uh, I'll use an example from just today, um, a bridge struck um, or a truck struck a bridge uh, on I-87, uh, just six miles from my house here, closed the interstate, and the overpassing road is closed indefinitely. And what's the cost of, of, that, um, of that one um, uh, accident that just happened? And how much GIS data could we pay for for what it's going to take to repair that bridge, right? So, mm. um, so we've come together and we've brought together all of the major wayfinding companies, and that's the term I'm using for all the companies who put out the phone apps and, and um, you know, Apple, Google here, TomTom. Tom. Frank, just to be clear, this is a NISJIC sponsored thing or is this federal yes. highways? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a blend of both, right? So it's a NISJIC um, initiative um, to extend a project that federal highways started. So kind of a neat thing. Federal highways has a program where they want to be able to communicate to all those companies, the existence of work zones, um, the work zone data exchange um, specification. And now we're saying, great, yes, that's a, that's a traffic safety thing, let's do that, but let's also extend that so that we can convey bridge clearance and exit numbers and passability of the road. And, and it'll go on and on for those things that we in government know are gonna happen. And that's our value add, we know that uh, an exit number is going to change well before it happens in the field. Somebody put in a work order to have that sign built and somebody else put in a work order to put the sign up, right? So um, when the work zone results in some change in the road network that people need to know about through their cell phone apps, let's just not go back to the old state when the work zone is cleared. Let's have the data reflect the new change. So um, we're right now working um, on a extension to that specification to communicate bridge clearance. And this is something that the director of traffic safety at DOT um, asked me what we could do about. Um, and there's been some, some pretty interesting um, statistics around, we're not talking about super tall trucks. We're talking about fairly low bridges in a lot of these cases. Yeah, yeah. But um, there's um, an example of a, of a double decker bus um, that, uh, uh, full of passengers, um, uh, while the driver was following a, um, uh, a cell phone app, got off its route and, and, and in the Syracuse area went under an underpass and, and people were killed and it was, it was tragedy. And that driver um, was, was crushed. It, was, it, was, it ruined his, the rest of his life. He, he never forgave himself for that. Um, and uh, we have the data to prevent that, right? So mm. DOT over a, over a nine year period looked at the 615 um, bridge strikes that were uh, reported at the time. And um, there might've been more, um, I'm sorry, 618, there might've been more bridge strikes, but those are the ones where you know the truck was stuck and there was an investigation, right? Mm -hmm. And there's others that they discover when they just do bridge inspection. But of those 618, they determined that 511 of them we're using a GPS device of some sort, often inappropriately, the kind of way, the wayfinding device you'd use to drive your Honda Civic through the road network. Yeah, yeah. Right? And 516 were out of state truckers. So the point is that we have the data, even though a lot of that technology was inappropriately used, we have the data to let somebody say, hey, 
my vehicle is this high. Don't route me where it's going to, um, where it's going to hit mm. something I don't want to hit. Right. So, yeah. um, we've got some good flow around that through okay. the Yeah. That's, that's a terrific example uh, and a life-saving example of how government and commercial data needs to come together to just solve an important safety problem. That's a great example. And, and that's going to pay for itself. Like I said, you know, if we if we save a few bridges, not just saving lives, but the money that it takes to repair that infrastructure um, is uh, is incredible. It pays for a lot Absolutely. of Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, let's let's move on. I, I there's another great example that I know you've got uh, some fairly uh, good experience working with Frank, and that's geotagged social media. You know, for people that have enabled uh, location services on their phones and so you know and it's not that many people but with virtually everybody having a phone even a, even a whatever even whatever it is 10 percent of people leave that on and, and are leaving their gps breadcrumbs that becomes hugely valuable um you, you want to talk about that yeah sure um and this really goes to um kind of taking the pulse of um of the community, you know, if you if you just map a particular hashtag, what are people talking about? You know, and we looked at this first when Ebola first came into the country, right? And that day, if you look at the at the tweets, they kind of lit up like fireworks, right? And all of a sudden, this was, mm. um, and you could see the geographic spread of a phenomenon. Um, that same um, kind of a, an approach could help get the message out um, when it comes to. Uh, stragglers as, as we're uh, looking at um, vaccination patterns yeah, across the yeah. country. I, I knew that's where you were going with this. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and, and we talk about local unofficials. You know, we, we get the message out through local officials. How about local unofficials? How about those people that, that are kind of leaders through social media that they have groups of people listening to and we have a geotag so we know what geographic area they're in? Um, yeah, yeah. And then I think there's other examples of, you know, looking at different ethnic populations that may be non-English speakers and things that you can identify uh, as gaps um, and and ways to reach them and and make sure that we get the message out and get these vaccination uh, uh, gaps closed. Yeah. Right, right. And it's really the lay of the land and understanding what's happening in a particular anomalous area, you know, or um, is this area seeing a low vaccination rate? And uh, why is that? Maybe it's the um, the closest site is a drive-in site, and and um, this this particular area has low vehicle ownership, or you know who knows. But um, mm -hmm. it's about blending that data together that we gain those insights that we can take action with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Frank, I I know you've got a story I want to prompt you for from uh, from Jeff Quackenbush, who's a GIS coordinator in uh, in Central New York, uh, around data for insurance companies and and how that impacted property insurance rates. Why don't you tell that little story? Yeah, sure. And and I'm not sure I have all the details quite uh, quite nailed down, but um, but I think I have um, enough of the story to really be be proud of how it happened. Um, there is an organization that advises. Uh, insurance companies on uh, fire insurance rates. And they do that by inspecting the quality and equipment of the local fire department and the prevalence or the existence of um, municipal water. And Jeff uh, determined that uh, this organization was missing a big piece of public water supply in the counties he served. So he just sent them the data and said, hey, this is all the water distribution network in this area that you're missing it. And they folded that data in. And as a result, um, the citizens that live in that area um, are enjoying a reduction in their in their homeowner's insurance uh, because of the fire risk being lower. Yeah, I, I love that story. That's that's so good. And, um, and yeah. it took no, it, it was data that existed. It just took communication. It yeah. You know, and when you talk about the insurance industry, they're actually becoming very, very active in in GIS, and and so we have that kind of leads to another example of uh, of blending. So we know that there's a big consortium of the property insurers that are that are having imagery flown, and um, so that they have pre-disaster imagery. And then they fly fresh imagery, like in a in a flooding or a hurricane event. So they've got quality pre and post disaster, and then they're using AI technology to to look at the changes and and know exactly where the where the damages have occurred. 
and and the blending comes in because uh, they make that data available uh, to the states that are responding to these emergencies so that um, everybody can work off the same base. And then, Frank, I know you've got a little bit deeper story about how some of that blending works too. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty neat because it, it, it works on so many, um, on so many levels. Um, because of that imagery coming in, they can start the insurance adjustment process remotely. And that imagery can be in another part of the country and they don't have to have insurance adjusters um, screwing up the traffic pattern. Right, uh, right. You know, Walking around with way. a clipboard, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and the faster they can help, uh, the more they can help the state reopen roads and get schools back together and, and get facilities up and running, the lower the impact on the actual insurance, insurance adjustment. You know, it's, it, it, we get back to normal faster, there's less liability financially on their, on their customers. So it's in their interest um, to get um, to get those um, reopenings happening as quickly as they can, which is good for our citizens. I love yeah. it. Yeah, no, that, that is that's great. Um, so there's there's just so much going on. I think let's use the last part of our, our chat here, Frank, to just talk about, you know, how do we how do we get people to embrace this? You know, because I think um, what we're seeing is that the data is certainly there now. And the opportunities to do a lot more of this blending are there now. I think what needs to shift is the, the, the you know, it's a, kind of a cliche, but the paradigm shift, you know, the, the shift in our thinking around doing this. And I think what we really want to do is embrace this trend. And I love the, I love the question you, you posed there. Like you want to ask yourself every day, how do I, how can I be most effective? What is the right role? And, and, and the, that leads to a, a different set of questions about, how to make best use of the data and, and how to make it all come together. Right. Right. And it's going to kind of sneak up on us, you know? Yeah. Um, now this image, this image up here, I, I got this out of NASA. NASA has a collection called uh, their, their digital earth uh, collection where they've, they've picked some really nice scenes that have been collected over the years. And uh, this particular scene is um at Cairo, Illinois, which is where the Ohio River on the right, the more brown sediment loaded one here, and the Mississippi on the left are coming together. And this this is actually an interesting image because it's not a satellite image. It's actually a handheld photo taken by one of the astronauts aboard the International Space Station <laughs> with a long focal length camera. Uh, it's kind of cool. But if you look closely, where those where those two flows come together in the lower part of that image, what you see is they're very distinctly separated. And as the flow continues down the river, the, the, they start to blend. And, and what you, if we had more, you know, look at this, Aaron's tracing it. Look, at, that's real time uh, GIS in action here. Uh, if, we, if we had the image going a couple miles downstream, you would see that it's fully blended uh, by the time you get further down the image. And I think this is a great metaphor for what's going on and has been going on in the data world. You know, we've got government data, think of the government data maybe as the Mississippi and the commercial data as the, as the Ohio River here. Now that data, um, we're, you know, in the, in the earliest uses of it um, is still quite distinct. You might be using it as a replacement or a gap fill, and you you know which data is commercial and which is not. But as we as we do more of this blending, like in the in some of these current examples we're talking about with the vaccination tracking and so forth, it's fully blended. It's kind of downstream from here. So I think this this scene for me kind of puts it all together that we're we're living in a world where we're all going to be doing a lot more blending. And more, as we as we do more and more of it, it's going to become less and less important to us uh, to distinguish among. The, it's all just good data to so, help solve real problems with. Yeah, that's great. I love that image, and I love that metaphor. And and we're really uh, in this uh, ecosystem together, and in the data ecosystem. And that's mm. a term that some people roll their eyes at a little bit, but but I don't. You know. In, we borrow in, in geography, we borrow from the natural sciences um, to explain a lot of what, uh, what happens and you actually measure it. And, um, you know, for instance, the interaction between two cities is a direct relationship between the size of those cities and the distance between them. That's just Newtonian physics. That's the gravity model, right? And when it comes to our, our ecosystem, 
the health of a natural ecosystem is measured by its biodiversity. And I'd challenge us to measure the health of our geospatial ecosystem by the diversity of inputs we can blend together to make, uh, to make us all play our most impactful role. Wow, that's, that's really great. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna make it crack a joke about people that weren't expecting to hear Newtonian physics in this talk <laughs> about blended data, but I don't want to spoil your metaphor because I really like the health of the ecosystem uh, yeah. measured by its diversity, and uh, and so that's what it's all about. Uh, so Frank, th this has been very enjoyable. I, I know we've got questions uh, uh, coming in on the chat here. Um, Aaron, do you want to do you want to play moderator here and uh, and feed us questions? Absolutely. And thank you both for the deep conversation. Just so you'll know, this is like improv at the jazz club, right? Because <laughs> we didn't rehearse this one <laughs> as um, everything you heard is uh, the true and heartfelt opinions of our panelists here today. And now you have an opportunity to probe even deeper. Um, so I want to take it to Q&A. Just a quick announcement. Some of you have been asking questions in the chat. Um, I want to make sure that we get to all of them um, and I'll do my best here. But if, if you did ask one in the chat, if you re-ask it in the, the Q&A button, um, it's an easy way to make sure we, we hit everybody. Um, and then to answer one of the questions that came in, yes, uh, this webinar will be recorded and distributed to all of you um, via a link. So you'll be able to share it with anyone um, or re-watch it or find your favorite uh, parts and put them on slow-mo, <laughs> your choice. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm going to start here with some of the other questions coming in. Um, and the first one from uh, David is, how do organizations manage the process of moving to the 2022 datum? This seems to be something that is not being discussed much, and it, it sounds like um, it is a huge task to make it successful. Is that something you guys want to take a stab at? You know, that could be a that that actually warrants a separate webinar because it's very very detailed. Stay tuned. <laughs> <It's coming. laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's you know, I guess it's relevant here in that uh, when you're blending data. Uh, having data that has consistent geospatial references is important, or you're going to have things that don't fit. Uh, and I'll just, I just, I think that's deep enough for now. Is that there's a, there are there are things that you need to do as a as a GIS professional when you're bringing data set. It doesn't matter whether it's commercial or government or two commercial data sets or multiple government data sets. You have an obligation to do the processing in a way that. Uh, maintains the integrity of them. And part of that is understanding their 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 spatial references and uh, and being faithful to that. Frank, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, sure. I love the metaphor that our friends from um, NGA um, use. And that is, you know, if when my kids were growing, we could mark their height on a wall, right? And that's a vertical, um, that's a vertical measurement. The datum is the carpeting on my floor, right? That was there. And now I tear up the carpeting and put in hardwood all those measurements are still valid. They're just referenced to a different datum, right? Mm. So this is about the metadata. Um, and the most important thing we can do is be very clear, the vertical and horizontal data metadata. We get that nailed down now, um, we've got a chance in the future. The nuts and bolts of, of how you actually do the transformation, that's for somebody with a different skill set than I have. But um, I know we have to keep track of the, uh, the metadata and then be very clear and just be aware. Um, yeah, we're making uh, right. no, that's a great question. Okay, we got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to keep them coming. Um, yep, we've got some from Karen here. First, she wants to see photographic proof of of that curly hair. Uh, next webinar, <laughs> we'll do before and after pictures. For yeah, all you know, of Frank, I, I I was thinking we I know there's a picture of you and I in a conference booth very early in our yeah. careers, and I was wondering where that was, and I was going to try to <laughs> give it to Aaron to put in the deck, but I, I didn't I didn't even look for it. Next Sorry. time, but more specifically, she is also <laughs> asking uh, what data blending models are you seeing specific to DOTs and the verification of their traffic counts? We're employing data blending at text dot in this regard. Um, for example, their weather data and which companies mm. are in the traffic arena. Um, and if, you know, do you have any recommendations there in terms of reliability and uh, accuracy, et cetera? Mm. I, I don't know that I could answer that as specifically as that, but I, I do know that the Federal Highway Administration 
which you know uh, they are, they have this uh, program called HPMS, the Highway Performance Monitoring System. Every state uh, produces the data sets that that go into an HPMS submittal. And it's a 50-piece jigsaw puzzle that is assembled at USDOT at Federal Highways, and they supplement that with commercial data. So there's been, there was a a study called the HPMS reassessment that actually AppGeo was one of the contractors on, and part of that was a recommendation to start blending commercial data into that. So the HPMS national data sets that he used to set national standards on how the transportation agencies across country work now use some commercial data that's blended in with the with the state data sets there. So that's a it's another good example. Yeah, I think the other area we are I'll just throw into my own answer here. Um, some of these companies that are doing in car routing applications have the ability to provide those traces of where vehicles um, have been and to update not only traffic counts, because we know this many people have the app and drove down the road, but also uh, there was an example from Frank we, when we were talking where they could actually find n new uh, exit ramps and things that weren't in the data set, right? Um, pretty, pretty interesting example yeah. there of where commercial is uh, conflating with the authoritative yeah, and while I, if I could just pipe in once more here, there is a, a really good uh, conference event, virtual event happening next week called the GIS for Transportation, GIST. I know Frank's a veteran of many times of that, and so am I. And, uh, and the agenda includes a lot of topics about commercial data sources uh, uh, this year. So we're seeing more and more of it. So uh, I, I don't know who asked that question, but you might want to see about registering for the GIST virtual event and, and hear firsthand uh, from some of these companies that have these data sets. Very good. good. Uh, I'm going to keep moving on just so we may get to all these. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a, a really cool one um, from first name Greg. So as data stewards, how can we ensure we're making our data available in the most usable formats to ensure that this blending um, is going to happen? Yeah, I, I can take a crack at that one. That's okay, I, I have I an opinion, it. but I want to hear what you say first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, to me, it's about uh, web services that scale without human scaling, right? So you don't need to add another staff member to touch another thousand users, right? So you scale those web services. They have to be well documented, and it's easiest to well to make them well documented if they do one simple thing. So our geocoding web service, for instance. You send in an address, it gives you a correctly spelled address and a coordinate. People say, hey, Frank, can you, can you um, make that also give me back the school district? Um, the answer is no, but you take that coordinate, you bounce it against your school district data set. That does one simple thing. It draws you a map of school districts or you send it a coordinate, it gives you back what school district you're in. Um, same with our imagery and our elevation data sets. They do, they do um, things that are simple and you string them together all you want. Um, and so, and we're, we're on a pace, we might come close to in 2021, a billion hits on our web services. We're, we're, wow. we did seven, Huge. 75 million, um, hits last month. Wow. Um, yeah. So. Uh, th that's great advice. Frank. what I would add to that is, um, when you, when you publish your services, uh, there are open standards from OGC that are, you know, those are going to be the most neutral. Uh, and and find the widest audience. So things like a web feature service or web mapping service or web mapping tile service. And then and then the flip side of that is something you mentioned earlier, Frank, which is the metadata. So you really need to publish the details about that data set so that the user can evaluate its fitness for their purpose. Um, you have to assume that all these people that are gonna access your service uh, have no firsthand familiarity with it. They're only gonna know uh, what you publish about it um, as a description. And uh, so that's really important. Metadata is, uh, is something to, to take very seriously. Right. And, it, and all of a sudden it starts to pay when you're, when you're going to eliminate a thousand questions by taking an extra couple hours to do a really good job in the metadata. That's a pretty good return on investment now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Aaron. Want to get in the last couple here. Um, Let's see. So Phil asks, what are the top partnerships or initiatives around blended data that you would recommend for a local gov GIS? Um, for example, a company who's always having problems finding a particular address or a street that um, is having issues with the misclassification. Um, do you 
uh, who can they work with to correct those type of issues? Yeah, Frank, I think that leads back to that NISJIC initiative. Maybe you want to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's great. I'm glad you asked that question, Phil. Um, we have um, uh, really two, two parts to this um, getting data in the hands of the wayfinding companies. And that is addresses are on, a, their, on their own path and uh, rolling up addresses to a state collection or directly to the national address database is a direction that um, we're, we're kind of steering those commercial providers. So if you want to get a, an address fixed in Google or Apple or, or um, Waze, rolling it up to the national address database, we're hoping that that becomes the conduit that becomes so easy for those companies to pull from that it just flows. Um, so not quite all there yet, but that's, that's a general direction. And then on the road network, um, getting plugged in with, um, through your state GIO with this authoritative data for um, the extension of the work zone data exchange specification, that's where we're gonna see those changes to the road network that, that uh, flow from uh, local and state government uh, officials uh, all the way up to those companies. Great question. Very good answer. Yeah, I know as a as a Google partner ourselves, we get asked that similarly a lot, and I think th those partnerships are going to be really important to just keep the knowledge flowing in the right direction. Uh, last question that I'm seeing here, and again, if you do have additional questions, feel free to reach out via email, or or and we can get in touch uh, further. But uh, Jana asks about um, getting higher resolution imagery within Esri. She works. Uh, within the DOE national lab and is always creating maps of utilities um, and was wondering if there's a way to add better imagery. Um, I'll throw in a plug for our, our partner hexagon who has some real sharp imagery for you, but um, Bill or Frank have any other recommendations about um, getting access to some of those um, commercial licensed imagery providers? Sure. Well, I can see, you know, she's asking about different base maps uh, and I'm kind of chuckling myself because Frank, I know you'll remember this, but early on when, when, uh, when these kind of prepackaged base maps started being delivered with software, we kind of scoffed at them and we, we created our own base map and, um, and we're kind of critical that, uh, you know, why would you want to use these out of the box base maps that don't do, you know, do things as well as we do them. And now with the kind of the reverse is true, almost everybody is using one of the out of the box base maps and not, not creating their own. So things have really flipped in, in a bunch of years, but yeah, the, I mean, the, the, these base maps are just another layer in your stack. You can, you're not bound to use the out of the box base maps or the out of the box imagery layers. Um, you know, these are, these are imagery services, whether it's a commercial one or whether it's a state uh, program. And some of those are coming together now. We've seen uh, many of the state programs are now using a commercial source of imagery. That's generally delivered as a streaming service where you have a URL. And so you're simply gonna point your GIS application to that service for your imagery. And that's what's gonna appear in your, in your GIS application. Right. Great answer, Bill. And we are just now at three o'clock. So I want to respect all of our attendees time and our panelists time here today. Um, any closing remarks to to uh, send us off here this afternoon? I, I think, you know, uh, this is going to be the future. Uh, lots of blend, lots of blended data. I think we're going to think less and less about the, the process of blending the data and more and more about how to get the right results. And that's really the way we want to be. Frank, you want to make the last shot here? Yeah, I'm just super grateful to be part of this uh, community where we can have these conversations and we can all uh, collaborate. GIS is a collaborative technology and it pulls together collaborative people by their very nature. Um, and what a, what a great thing so that we can all uh, rely on each other's work. So it's going to just uh, continue. So thanks for having me. <laughs> Looking oh, no. forward to it. <laughs> our, our pleasure, Frank, as always. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you to all our attendees and a big thank you to Frank uh, for joining us today. We appreciate the time and we look forward to having you back. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.